We'll call this meeting to order. First up is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Welcome, everyone, and we will proceed on with roll call, please. Fish. Hausman, Here. Jones, McInerney, Here. Parsons, Present. Wells, Mayor Beasley. Here. We have a quorum, so we can move on. Um, Brian, refresh my memory on what we're going to talk about or not talk about on the street well, the, traffic study. The township request. Okay. I just got the item 12B. All right. We you just want, got the traffic counts today. You want that off? So, yeah, okay, that's fine. So I would entertain a motion and a second for that amended agenda. So moved. Second. A well, motion from Parsons, second from Hausman to approve the agenda, the amended agenda. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Good. Um, item four, we have the minutes of the February 1st briefing and the February 5th regular council meeting. I again will entertain a motion and a second for that. Okay. A motion from Hauslin, second from Parsons to approve the minutes of those two meetings. Questions or discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Item number five we have claims for February 20th. Again, I will entertain a motion and a second. A motion from Fish, second from McInerney to approve the claims. Questions or discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Um, visitors and timed items. I have nothing listed, but you are welcome to come up and address the council. You have five minutes. If not, do you have questions or answer period today? Um, no. Okay. All right. Moving on. We have old business, the second reading of Ordinance 560, which establishes an designating members of the tree board I would move for approval mayor a motion from fish seconded by Hausman to make ordinance 560 which is going to basically combine members of the tree board and the park board correct yeah. okay take and take you Okay. With that, is there any other discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And then we have Ordinance 561, which is a rezone of Track 2 Westview Estates from General Business or GB to Medium Density Residential District R2. And it is the property physical pro address is 105 East Redwood Circle. This is our second reading. This I will also entertain a motion in a second. I have a motion from Parson, second by McInerney to approve the second reading of Ordinance 564, which rezones the property at 105 East Redwood Circle to medium density residential district R2. Discussion. If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed. All right. Uh, golf course. Any business? Okay. Waiting for it to open. That will be a few weeks down the road, I believe. Uh, police. I see the chief is back there holding down the wall back there. 
Anything? Anything? Anything exciting? <coughs> Nothing. I think we're good then. All right. We're good. We're good. All right. Item 10, we have the work report in front of us for the park department. Um, we have RCM service pay app number five for Aspen Park concession restroom, restrooms. And we have an updated some pictures of the progress being made. Obviously, there's some because I see snow in the ground. So obviously, they're still out there doing work on it. I would make a motion to approve that pay up, Mayor. Second. A motion from Fish, seconded by Parsons, to approve the pay up number five, Aspen Park concession restroom building. Questions or discussion? Are they on track with all the timelines to finish for the first tournament or games that were planned? I mean, are still on track with the original timeline? The they're on time with the construction of the restroom concession building as far as the field goes and whether they're going to be able to play on it in time is going to depend greatly on the weather and whether the sod is down the, the infield will be completed the concession stand or concession stand restroom and the grandstands will be would be completed in time it's just a matter of whether they want to get on that grass in the outfield are they planning to uh, kind of ease into it with the few games here and there they're just going to go I uh, can't think of a good term right now that's appropriate <laughs> but um, full bore that thank you right away I mean I know they want to use it for what they can so I, I would anticipate they're going to watch the grass and see what it can handle all right they're going to play in valley I know in the meantime if they can't get on the field here All right, I had a motion and a second to approve that pay up. Any other questions or discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Anything else, Park and Rec? Uh, no, we have a meeting coming up. All right. That takes us to item 11, administration. We have a discussion on liquor license fees. You gotta push the little side button there. Now hit the purple button. There we go. Okay. Now you're on. Liquor license. Um, Brian was gonna do some more investigating. Is that correct? I sent out an email to the city administrators in the state. I think I heard back from four. They're all smaller cities. They're class two cities, so they're limited to twelve hundred bucks. Yankton did uh, confirm that they're still at one dollar per capita. So they're at 14, 4, 14.5 roughly. The, uh, the last private transactions with uh, tailgaters and d and Ds, was there licenses available in those transfers? Or were Correct. we those, at those were transfers. I know, but was there ones available that the city had at the time, or, would, or was there zero? Tailgaters would have been. Yes. yes. Right. Yep. Remind me. <laughs> About uh, SBA. Oh, I just had done some checking, and I really don't think it has any bearing on the price of our licenses, but um, I can just speak for the bank that I work for. We finance uh, liquor licenses on a regular basis, and so does SBA that we work with. So, But again, I don't think that has any bearing on our prices. I did have some uh, business people reach out to me that currently have liquor licenses, and of course they're concerned <clears throat> about our um, lowering that cost, and is that going to impact the value of their business? Uh, from a business standpoint, I want to support them. From a city standpoint, I'm not sure that that's our place, so I'm kind of caught on that one. But at this time, it's only a one-time <clears throat> fee and then yearly what do they pay you? 
Yeah, it's a yearly renewal, but what is that yearly renewal? 1500 that's what I thought. So it's a one-time fee that they paid. Tailgaters, tailgaters have paid it. And Mark, did you pay it with D&D? Well, we have to see the sale price of what you, you know, of what it is. But So basically, tailgaters stated that they paid for it. Um, but it's a one-time fee, and on that is 1500 you know, so is that going to lower their, lower the cost of their business? You know, we have to look at other businesses too. That's that was a transfer fee. That was, you know, what they bought the business for, and at that time, that's what our liquor license was. But at this point, now we have businesses coming to town that are not purchasing a liquor license because of the price. So, I started doing some research, and yeah, Yankton is basically just like Brian did. Yankton is basically the highest one. Nobody else in the state has our problem. Seems to be the cause for a few things. No. Mm -mm. No. And we're the only one that has three of them sitting on the books. You know, and, and so, <coughs> Spearfish and, and those places, they have more restaurant type liquor license instead of holding a liquor license like if a chain came in and that and we that was part of the discussion when we had this two three years ago that there's a difference between those type of, of places um, it, it's a rock and a hard place because you're looking at hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and it was not $125,000 three years ago. All of a sudden, now we have three of them. We have a, a business that would be interested in purchasing a liquor license, but feel the fee is too high for that. Um, I've also talked to a few um, local businesses um, that serve food with, with their liquor, and they have said, mm, yeah, maybe it is a little too high, but $8,000 is too low, too. Mm -hmm. So trying to find that happy medium is, is a little tough. I think you need to consider, too, that <clears throat> we have three available. Maybe it's not all because of price, but maybe it's because of our proximity to Sioux Falls, too. Yes. Um, but I, I do think 125 is too high. Just... But I think 8000 is too low. If there's some place in the middle I think we could find, I think that would be appropriate. And and I will admit I was on that bandwagon for the 125000 And in retrospect, it is too high. I just don't know what number to get to and how do we, you know, what do, what do we hang our hat on for that? I mean, we, the comparables, like if you were going to buy a house, you would look at comparable homes in your neighborhood to see what the prices were. We don't have any comparables. Mm -hmm. And we've... We've been talking about this now for over a year, and I think that's what keeps getting brought up is that we need some science, we need some analytics to get us to the right number, and I don't think it's out there. I don't think we're ever going to find a report or something that we can all point to that says this is what the number should be. Mm -hmm. I've been on both sides of this because I'm very sensitive to those businesses and what they paid, but I'm also the standpoint of economics and supply and demand. I mean... My fear is that if we lower it to 50, we are essentially depreciating one of their assets, but at the end of the day, is it truly an asset that's worth 125 if nobody's willing to pay that? And I don't think the answer is that, and, and, and Barb's right. We have to balance what's best for not only our businesses, but what's also best for our citizens, and what's best for our citizens is that the market is telling us that the price is probably too high and that we're not attracting businesses that we could be, that could be providing tax revenue to offset some of the taxes that the citizens are paying us. Um, so I, I think it is appropriate and it's time to lower it. I don't think we're gonna find um, some study or point to something that tells us what the right number is. I think we just need to, as a council, make a decision. I would be comfortable anywhere from 50 to 75-ish. Um, I, I, I certainly don't wanna lower it too far because as, as we've talked before that, Essentially, this fee is the only tool that we have today to determine kind of what businesses we want to attract as a city. If we set it to five, ten thousand bucks, we're just going to get a bunch of internet cafes that want a liquor license, and that's too low, and that's not what we want to attract. If we set it too high, we're not getting the businesses, we're not getting the tax revenue. Um, so I, I would be comfortable in that fifty to seventy-five range. I don't know where others are at, but. and that's what. The, the 
four businesses that I've talked to, they said it, it's got to be at least 50, but it can't be up above 80. So that that's kind of where they were they were thinking. But like I said, it's it's a tough call. It's a very tough call. So if we do six dollars times our population right now, 87, 85 is that population. So it'd be 52,710. So it's six dollars per per capita, you know. So it'd be 52,710 at six dollars um, per thing. So. Then would that change in the census? Yeah. Then it would change as the census went in. Plus we'd get another one. So then we'd have four. If nobody purchases it before the census comes in, I still think maybe that might be a little bit too high. But it's workable for me. So I would be comfortable with the 52,710. And I'd make a motion to approve that amount. Oh, it's an it's oh an sorry. Oh, it's an ordinance. It's okay, ordinance. never so mind. We'll never mind. Yeah, we I have to draft an ordinance. <laughs> so 52710. So in that ordinance, you're, you're asking for always $6 per capita. $6 per capita at 87.85 is 52710. So that is what I'm asking for in the ordinance. Okay. So the, then then it, we wouldn't set it as a as a specific total amount. It's as our population changes, our liquor license will change also with right, it. Right, yeah. I still think it's a little high, but I, I'm okay with 50. I have, and I'm, I'm, I think I could get there. I'm actually on the opposite side. I'd probably lean towards the high end just because we're dropping it so drastically that I'd rather do it in increments rather than. We also increased it quite drastically. Oh, I, I agree completely. <laughs> so this was, is, this we know is, that was too far now, yeah. um, but I think we could learn gradually that if we drop it to 75 and sit there for a year, nobody wants it, then we try 50, um, but rather than going all there at once. My fear is we drop it to too low, and all of a sudden we get three applications in the next month, and we limit ourselves from future opportunities. Well, it takes you know two readings, yeah. so it takes yeah. a good yeah. month. So I can draft something for you, and then we can always change it from $6 to $7 or you know, something else, too. Mm -hmm. That's good. We'll have the other and you'll have the so based on your comments, John, and, and again, I apologize because I haven't been part of these in the past. Have there been, ever been discussion that if you're concerned about, you know, internet cafes coming in, do you ever, can you lease the licenses? I don't believe we're allowed to. We're the allowed state, to there was the state the is state pretty restricted. They were thinking about it, and it didn't make it through their committees? I don't remember that. Okay. Yeah. Basically discuss that if a, somebody comes with the money and has a fee and a business plan and, you know, I don't remember all the requirements, but essentially we have to grant them if they meet all the, the requirements that are met. So we can't pick and choose what types of industries or businesses we'd like to, to give it to. It'd have to be defensible in court because they can just argue that, hey, you're keeping us out. You know, so. No. You, you still get to look at the applicant's that are asking and decide if it's the type of business, the manner of operation, minors, whether they come in and out. There's a bunch of factors you still get to look at whether or not you're going to give them the license. So just because somebody has a check for 52710, you still go through and you look at it and you may say, no, this is not appropriate to right, have but, a holder. But yeah, I understand that. They have to be reputable and all the back yeah. of it. But it has to be, we have to be consistent. If, if one yeah, comes over the internet cafe reason. and they meet all the check boxes, the next one that does, we have to meet, you know, give it to them. So right then you're out of three licenses. Right away, so. Lisa, can you have one license that's just designated for a certain amount of food and booze? Isn't that, that kind of like that restaurant? That'd be like a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. the state differentiates yeah, okay. and I'm not a hundred percent up on it because it's been a couple of years since we discussed them but I know that with Spearfish when they had that big growth spurt and they were getting all those those chains of restaurants coming in that's what they instead of trying to get the the city liquor license they applied for a restaurant liquor license because more of their their sales were gotcha. into food we did have um, some information provided by a commercial realtor, and his suggestion was sixty-five thousand. So we're you know we're close. We're close. We're, we're close. close. And when the census hits, you know it'll go up too at that time. So it'll be. Mm -hmm. So that's my recommendation. All right, very good. Um, item B, we had two applicants for 
the opening and planning and zoning. And um, one was just introduced to us not so long ago when he applied to fill this seat. And the other one, we have um, uh, a local Judd Usman. And Jim, do you realize how, how many Thursdays it's going to be? <laughs> it's every other Thursday. It's the first and third, or yeah, first and third Thursdays every month, and uh, they're about uh, well, they've been running about two and a half hours <laughs> per meeting because <laughs> they're going over some new zoning. Um, I was very impressed with with uh, his interview to to fill the council seat, and I reached out to him and said, "Please apply for this planning and zoning." So that would be my recommendation for an appointment. I, I've known Jed for a long time too, but I, I like how this young man's thinking. So I, I think that would be uh, a good addition to our. Uh, plus, he's got a lot of young kids. As he's told us, and so as we develop parks and stuff, I think he'll be a good resource for us. That would be my recommendation to fill that seat. Motion. I need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion from Hausman, second by Parsons, to have Jim Swarzel as the new planning and zoning. Now, your term goes through 43019, and then you'd have to be reappointed by the mayor. He is taking Todd, Todd. Stone's. Oh, Todd, Todd, Stone. Todd, his business and his family commitments and the hockey things are yep. taking up a lot of his time. Sure. So. He said he could fill in up until yeah, May, until May, or until a new replacement came. So, mm -hmm. all right, um, you have to give the staff your email so, contacts and stuff. Okay. All right. You're welcome, Jim. So, I did call for a vote, I believe. No, no, you didn't. Okay. Yes. So, all in favor of that appointment aye. signify by saying aye. aye. All right. Welcome aboard, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for for taking my suggestion. Anything else, administration? No. All right. Item 12, we have the maintenance report in front of us. Um, we, we struck out B. We have traffic study sandstone and holly. Just as an update on that traffic study at the uh, intersections at Heritage and Sandstone out on Holly Boulevard, um, they are going to perform traffic counts at the end of this month. So that is their first step in revising our existing traffic study. Okay. Good. Well, I was questioned as to why we had to redo that traffic study. Is it just so that we have some criteria to base our decision on? Yeah, I mean, it's going to compare the existing information or the existing time frame that we're in right now in 2018. That was nine years ago that we had our original traffic study done. So I would anticipate that we're going to see some higher traffic volumes, although um, there is some indication that traffic patterns have changed because Highway 100 has opened up now to Rice Street. Um, Six Mile Road and Rice Street, there was plans, the county had plans to put in a traffic signal at that intersection this summer. And now they have, based on the new traffic counts that they have at Six Mile and Rice Street, they have canceled that project for some time. They've seen a significant decrease in volume at Six Mile Road because of the opening of Highway 100. And it makes sense that we would continue to see that decrease when Highway 100 is connected with the interstate at exit 406. Timberline is, well, I think that's later on. Mm -hmm. Tim Timberline still takes that traffic now, but Highway 100 will be a more inviting um, corridor once that's constructed and connected to I-90. Yeah, but the end of February, we won't be getting that Timberline traffic, so it's probably a accurate assessment then of I would think it would pick back up after Highway 100 got done now the Timberline's closed yeah I mean it, you, we might see an additional amount of traffic on Rice to get and, and Holly to get to Highway 100 and with the construction this summer as well um, down at Powder House I think we might see an increase in traffic on Holly and Rice
Uh -huh. Very good. Very good. Anything else on that? Any other questions or discussion on sandstone and holly? I'm glad that we're keeping up with that because we promised those residents that we would diligently work on finding a solution for the, them to get in and out. Are we, I mean, are we waiting for that traffic count to talk about what the next steps are after that? Because I don't know that those numbers are going to change how I feel about any of it, to be honest. I don't know that we discussed really anything until that traffic study is updated at this point. I mean, they're going to analyze the safety of that intersection. We really don't see a lot of accidents there compared to the volume of traffic that we have. And so if there's something that can be done, I know it, it, it's in conjunction with Metal, Metal Brook, Metal, is it Metal Brook? No. Metal Brook Trail and Heritage, the signal at Heritage, the connection um, at Sandstone. If there's something that we could do to just even put a bypass lane in or a left turn lane or there's going to be recommendations that come out of that traffic study if we're looking at even further into the future as the as it continues to develop west of Brandon and the industrial stuff on the north side we may look at wanting to extend our entire our full corridor that we did at Heritage and Holly and extend that west past Sandstone but then we're looking at a significant project so if there, if there was a need for that, that traffic study would indicate it. The traffic study that was done in 2009 indicated that the intersection was adequate. And we looked at installing a signal, but the volumes do not warrant a signal at Sandstone. Yeah. So the count will be done at the end of February. When do they think they'll have the study done? How much longer is that? I'm going? not sure how long that would take. I can ask and okay. get that information too. Okay. Keep us a, a praise of that. <clears throat> And I know that when we the traffic studies, we've talked about the bridge over the interstate leading to course, and then they say, well, there's not been enough accidents or fatalities, and one's too many. One's, one's too many, and, and unfortunately, the state looks at accidents compared to the amount of traffic, and we need to be able to, to come up with a solution for those people. Um, Item D, we have the slurry seal or micro seal, as I call it. Um, I'm surprised that Inner Mountain Slurry didn't win the bid, but they've been very good to us, and they're really good to work with. Yeah, the numbers on these bids be just because of the quantity. If that, it's a penny difference on a large quantity project like this, it can it can make that dollar difference that you're seeing right there, ten thousand dollars on a. I mean, that's our portion, but <laughs> this is a project that we do every year. It's a slurry seal project that's uh, street maintenance. Um, it's been very well received in Brandon. This is our fifth year, sixth year, I believe, Raleigh, right? Yeah, six years. So it's a project that we do in, in uh, coordination with the city of Sioux Falls and several other surrounding communities. And this, this engineer, this engineer, this contractor that we had bid this Missouri Petroleum has also been very good. To the city of Brandon with uh, the work that they've done and the amount of two hundred sixty-three thousand eighty-seven dollars and thirty-four cents. Uh, we discussed the thirteen thousand, roughly, that were over on the estimated portion of this project. It was really Park Street on the south end of town, and we have the city limits stop at the at the uh, park, and if we we maintain we maintain past the park to the bridge and if we wanted to take that portion of it out we would be within what we've budgeted but we think that Brian and I have spoken about it and there's some there's some money in the striping and, and curving gutter repair and the asphalt patching and it's basically that one fund that we could probably find that money so I would recommend, and if we don't, we just cut the project back. We just cut it short, and they're fine with that. So I'd recommend that we approve this bid. Okay. I recommend the approval of it, too. So the motion to approve. Second. Motion from Hosman, second by Fish, to approve the slurry seal bid to Missouri Pro Petroleum Products at 263 thousand dollars and change 
I have a motion and a second. Questions? If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? We need a spray patcher. We have worked that one to about death, haven't we? Yeah, 1997. Yeah. So. Time to upgrade. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got one bid. Uh, it was from Brock White Construction Materials. Uh, total bid was seventy-six thousand nine hundred six and fifty-three cents, and I would recommend that we do that. Um, actually, the second page, if you look there, he's also given us five hundred dollars trade-in value for our old one, which is <laughs> exceptional. About four hundred and ninety-nine dollars worth more than it's worth. Yeah, scrap metal probably would have got you close, but <laughs> not quite. No, nope. I have enough pictures of it. <laughs> A motion from Hausman, second from Parsons, to approve the spray patcher bid. Questions or discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you for making it last. Yeah. Next item we have snowplow quotes. Yeah, I got three quotes from uh, uh, Siouxland Trailer Sales. Um, custom truck equipment and northern truck equipment they were pretty comparable but all three of them recommended that we do not run an eight foot plow on our truck and they're basing that opinion off of what uh, Western is giving them um, I talked with my brother who's also a distributor and installer for the Western snow plows he said there are options you can put on there um, you can actually put a bigger leaf spring on it which we're, if you technically look at their specifications, it asks for a 4,600 pound front end on the truck. Ours is a 4,400 pound. So we're 200 pounds off. Um, the springs would be roughly $150 if we had to go that way. There's also a metal block that you can put on there, um, which would help with the suspension. They're 60 bucks for a pair. So I kind of look at it as we should do the uh, Siouxland trailer sales, buy the blade from them, and actually have hooky companies. They said they would install it for $600, which is less than even what uh, Siouxland trailer said they would do it for, but they all, all three of the companies did say they didn't want to install an eight foot blade on that truck. So I would like to do it. And anything less than the if you go to that midway plow that they recommended, that Western is recommending, it's too light duty of a plow for what we're using it for. If you were doing a driveway, you know, your personal driveway or helping another person out with a driveway, it'd be a different story. It's kind of a light duty um, plow. And for what we're using, it's gotta be a little more heavy duty. Matter of fact, some of my plows that I have now are nine foot twos on a one ton with beefed up suspensions. So I know it works. So you want the western, the the western eight foot straight pl uh, blade with all fifty two forty eight fifty two forty eight from uh, Siouxland Trailer Sales. Yep. yep. And then have hooky companies hooky company do, the, do the installation. For the Center. installation. Yep. Yeah, and you'd be below budgeted numbers. Yeah, we're still twenty three, little over twenty three hundred dollars below budgeted numbers. So. I have a motion from Hausman, second by McInerney, to improve, uh, approve the snowplow quotes, especially from uh, STS and Hooky companies. Questions or discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? All right, thank you. Item G, Timberline. So this is a map of the overall construction of Highway 100, uh, the yellow that you see on the left-hand side of the page is the new alignment of Rice Street, and that portion of the project is complete, as we all know, and then the remainder of that to the east out to the interstate, including the interchanges, is planned for construction in 18 and 19. That kind of orangish-yellow thing that you see over the Big Sioux River is obviously the bridge, and that's where Timberline and the bridge intersect. They're closing that timberline portion down uh, 
so that they can start the grading and utility work in that area. And then Timberline will still remain an intersection, but it'll only be a driveway for that home that they did not purchase down at the bottom of that hill. So the, their part of the construction is a proposed a cul-de-sac, basically just a dead end on Timberline. The Timberline will be permanently closed. There is a press release out right now. I can read that real quick. The South Dakota Department of Transportation will permanently close Timberline Avenue between Rice Street and Interstate 90 on Monday, February 19th, which was yesterday, correct? Mm -hmm. The roadway will be closed to complete the new Highway 100 corridor from Rice Street to Interstate 90. Motorists will be directed to Interstate 229, Interstate 90, Rice Street, and Highway 11 until the new Highway 100 roadway and the interchange is completed. The project has a substantial completion date of August 28, 2020. The prime contractor on this $55.6 million project is Riley Brothers Construction from Morris, Minnesota. And that is on the DOT's website. I also posted it on our city Facebook page. Is it going to remain open from Redwood to 60th Street North? I'm not sure what their plans are for that area. There is a change in the intersection. You can see where in the middle of that exhibit where 60th Street will curve to the north and Redwood will curve to the south and that will be an at-grade intersection for 60th and Redwood in the future. At-grade means that it won't be elevated. It won't, it'll be on, on fill ground. So at some point, I would imagine that Redwood would be closed. I'm not sure that they're going to be working that far north immediately. That is something I can check on, though, and get back to you, John. I assume Redwood's going to get a lot more traffic here a couple of years then and I know that's where we're doing our traffic study now to well at some time the old stagecoach road get paved to hook up another avenue into Sioux Falls off Redwood <laughs> up past the old sewer lagoons and that nice winding gravel road that's parallel to the intersection or the interstate township i i think that in general the the east west corridors i'm speaking about redwood um, park street as it turns into maple mostly those two i, I think those two we may see the impact of Highway 100 in the future and having that exit, that east-west access that is so difficult right now just because of the volume of traffic that we see on Holly and Rice. And, and uh, moving forward, I think some traffic studies will continue to develop. I know we've discussed one on Maple. It's been brought before the council before, Maple and Park Street. And that those connections as we move in, this area develops, I think you're going to see more of these areas be looked at and be hard surfaced. All right. Anything else on Timberline? No. Anything else, Streets? Uh, Good job today. Yep. Paved early. Er, Plowed. Not paved. Plowed early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And more this that happens too, so uh, that is it as far as I know for streets. All right. Item thirteen, water development committee report. Should I yes. Yes. Okay. You certainly may, my dear. So I wanted to um read a statement that the city council and mayor have put together about um the water quality just so that we get the facts out there as the way we see them. So the city council and the mayor are committed to providing safe water for Brandon. 
as there has been a number of questions over the past few months regarding our water quality and quantity, all of which impact safety, we wanted to take time to share this with you. The first point we want to make is about water quality. The city of Brandon's drinking water is safe. Our water quality is measured against a set of standards developed by the Environmental Protection Agency known as the EPA and enforced by the South Dakota Department of Environmental and Natural Resources known as the DENR. We have consistently met the standards and been below the maximum thresholds. In fact, the state of South Dakota concurs as we've won the Secretary's Award for Water Excellence 16 out of the last 16 years, one of only 44 systems out of 647 systems in South Dakota, putting us in the top 7%. And I will have this for the press, a copy, so you don't have to worry about that. These standards include maximum contaminant levels, known as MCLs, for radium and alpha. Again, the city meets all standards. Specifically, radium is a naturally occurring radioactive alkaline earth metal, and it's found in water systems that serve 53% of the country's population. The existing water treatment system reduces contaminant levels to meet the standards, below the standards. We have recently installed additional treatment at the water treatment plant that further reduces these levels in our water. In addition, if you use a water softener or a reverse osmosis system, the level is further reduced. While it may be desirable to have a water supply or provide water with no detectable radium, such a result can be extremely expensive. And we feel that we have been proactive. It's taken many years trying to maintain our water quality at a reasonable cost that is consistently proven to meet and be below the quality requirements. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about the levels of radium and gross alpha in well seven. Well seven is owned by the city of Brandon and is higher in levels than well six. While a water main has been installed from well seven to well six, it is closed off by a water valve. So none of that water from this well is entering our system. Modifications to the water treatment plan have recently been made to treat the water from well seven. Further testing will be done to assure that the requirements are being met before well seven is ever used. As for hardness, we all experience hardness in our water. South Dakota water can be considered hard, the whole state of South Dakota, and it ranges from one to seven 1,504 milligrams per what, Paul? L? Okay. Thank you. So the state average is 294. And ours has been tested, and it ranges between 365 and 375. So we're a little bit above the state average. Hardness is not a health-based issue, but it affects the aesthetics of our water. And so some of our residents have invested in a water softener to reduce the hardness. If our residents feel that we need to reduce the hardness in the water we supply, we can explore those costs further. Our goal is to provide the best quality but still keep water rates manageable for our residents. As for water quantity, last summer we were, formed, we were forced to limit lawn watering. And this occurred because our typical usage is about 800,000 gallons. At the peak, we were consuming over 2 million gallons per day. That's quite an increase. We have determined by utilizing that odd even watering system this summer, our needs should be about 1.5 million gallons. And that is projected to be sustainable for us for five years. A lot of volume, there's a lot of noise about this whole issue and we appreciate the interest of the citizens and I think some really great things are gonna come out of it. But it is not an emergency situation. I wanna emphasize that, it is not an emergency. We have time to explore other avenues without feeling the need to rush to a hasty solution. In fact, we have just put out a request for proposal for engineering firms to explore water sources for the city of Brandon. The sources might include Sioux Falls Water, Minnehaha County Water Corporation, which is known as MCWC, and other areas. The city will review the proposals in the hopes of engaging an engineering firm to search out other sources that will carry us for the next 40 years. So in December, we felt we were being proactive and we formed a Citizens Water Development Committee. And these folks are working really hard. They they're, have a wider range of knowledge and 
it's going to be good. They're gathering information. They formed a conser conservation subcommittee that's going to provide ideas for us to help reduce water cons consumption. I think that's one of the big keys that's going to come out of this whole process, and that is going to be very important um, for our water strategy. I, I, I want to note that in 2013, the city conducted a water study. And it's being currently updated. And based on those recommendations, we have worked over the past several years on various parts of the water strategy. It's been on our agenda all the time. So if you've missed it, we have been working on it. So we've secured land for water towers because we need more above ground storage. We have determined we're, we're going to uh, replace outdated pipe, new pipe. And we've planned for the water treatment plant expansion. And we also had to work on the rate structure because we can't just dump all of these expenses on our residents. So we're trying to be proactive and provide quality drinking water at an affordable rate and still stay, stay comparable to surrounding communities. Now, some of this information might, might be new to you. And you know that's unfortunate, but we want to stress that we have been working on this for a number of years, ever since I've been on council. Um, so we're really, you know, we're really confident that by for, by working with this new committee and um, continuing our research, we're going to come up with some solutions that will provide us quality and quantity. You know, we always encourage people to come to our meetings. It's taped. It's on TV. Um, the Water Development Committee meetings are open to the public. The next one is tomorrow at 6 o'clock here at the um, Council Chambers. We have a website. We put our information on Facebook. And so we hope that people will just continue to interact and um, search out information on our process. You know, nobody up here sits up here for the power. Let me tell you, there's very little power in this position. It's not like on TV. So we are here to serve the residents of Brandon, and we're trying to work together to um, do the best thing for Brandon. Our main purpose is to strive to make Brandon a great community into w in which to live, work, and play. And again, we, we appreciate all of the input and the interest. It's been great to get our citizens involved, and we just wanted to let you know what we have been doing um, so that you have the information available. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for your guys' work on that also. Um, Mr. Wells is not here. Um, one of you water committee people, do you have a have the information for the report? Yeah, I do have the update. It's not been completed as of yet, but I can okay. give you a little bit. Please, of please. You did so well the last time. <clears throat> Well, you were you were support for her. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, I learned. Um, let me just find it quick on my phone. Sure, not a problem. <clears throat> Will you state your name? Sure, Angie Nimmers, ten twenty eight Heatherwood Drive. Oh, that's the wrong one. Okay, so at our last meeting, we went and toured the water treatment plant. Um, to understand the HMO system was important to quite a few of the committee members, so thanks to Raleigh and Donovan, they took us on a tour, kind of gave us an idea of how water comes from the wells into the treatment plant and then how it is treated and then dispersed into the system. I think it was quite interesting to learn. We, were, we all walked into the pump house, is that what you would call it? And we're all kind of shocked that it wasn't just a hole in the ground, there was an actually a pipe there. Um, it was not what we anticipated. Um, so that was kind of neat. Um, let's see. Sorry. That's all right. You're doing fine. Really? Yeah. How would you think that? Let's see. Um, in the in the briefing, it, Amanda went through and kind of just discussed how um, 
when the water comes in, it goes through this process and this process. I'm not going to go through that because it'll all be on the website, I would hope, in the next few days. Um, then we came back to the council chambers and we just, we had a discussion on, um, lots of different things. Um, I got to get there. Hang on. Oh, yeah. Pat Hammond and Jay Gilbertson from East Dakota Water were here. And we discussed um, the gap. Um, we had talked at the meeting prior about doing a gamma log study of Well 7. And the city had reached out to Derek Isles. And the um, South Dakota Geological Society was not able to help with that because of a conflict of interest. But there was some information available um, about um, from an observation well that was close by well seven that had the gamma log information. So Pat had and um, Jay had maps out and we discussed that. We also discussed lithograph information about um, the Split Rock Creek Aquifer and how the water level of that is going down. Um, that suggests that recharge is not as abundant. Um, that was also in a report by Mr. Isles for the Split Rock Creek Aquifer. Um, um, we also talked about, um, you know, the, the screen in Well 7 is in what Pat Hammond refers to as a lovely material for landscape called um, um, the quartzite sand. That's where all the radium is living in Well 7. Um, and decided, and we all just discussed on how it's really not feasible money-wise to just, you can't just move the screen up. So <clears throat> we talked about that a bit. Um, then, um, let's see. That discussion led to confirming that repositioning the screen in Well 7 is not a good idea due to the fact that the pipe would need to be replaced. The integrity of the original pipe would be lost, the hole would have to be sealed off, and then the screen would have to be repositioned into what we would hope to be a better spot. That could take two to three weeks and a cost of about 20,000 bucks. While a brand new well could be around $60,000 with potentially safer readings and more production. Um, then we discussed how, well, how close a new well could be to well seven. Um, there was no um, distinct response um, and said it could be, as cl could be close as long as the land and water rights were available to create that well. Um, we also talked about um, well eight has been proposed as a good resources, a good resource, but we did not have a hard test for that well. Um, Um, we also talked about the scheduling conflicts, hence why we moved our meeting to tomorrow night. For There's a couple of um, water committee meetings that have moved to Wednesday night. March 21st is the next one. Um, let's see. We also had um, some discussion about frustrations with social media. Um, <clears throat> making sure that if we, if any of the committee members post anything, it's that we are making sure that it is our own opinion that is being, um, that people understand it's our own opinion, not that of the committee. Um, we also went through the RFP that was handed out and that um, it's already um, posted on the city's website. And then, um, Let's see. And then the um, Water Conservation Subcommittee shared their um, overview with the members. Um, the first meeting of that, since I'm on that one, I'll talk about that too, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay. Um, um, the Conservation Subcommittee shared their overview, um, including the members, and first steps, meeting times, and expectations of bringing the water committee group up to speed on the content of those meetings, which they will update that group tomorrow night at that meeting. Um, oh, 
I'll let Don bring that to you at your next good. council meeting. How's that sound? Sounds good. So that's about it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else on we're going to talk about on water? Good luck tomorrow. Do we know what the agenda is for tomorrow? Okay. All right. Item B, sewer line, 1300 block Rushmore, proposal from Stockwells. We've been discussing this sewer line over off of uh, Rushmore and Teton, and then it extends down to Sylvan Circle. And this was a proposal that we had requested from Stockwell to move forward with the design. Um, this is for the design and the construction admin, bidding and construction admin of that, of that project, starting at where we left off this last summer on Sylvan Circle and extending it. There's a map that you can kind of see on page 41. It just shows the highlighted area. Sylvan Circle to the west to uh, Manuel and Teton and then extend that to the south and replace the sanitary sewer line just out to Rushmore and get it out from underneath the apartment complex and it also runs underneath Clark Insurance a few feet underneath their foundation wall. And we would basically just relocate that sewer main and then extend services to it. Some of the discussion that we had Thursday was the um, at the briefing meeting was this project is part of an overall utility and street replacement project that we have broken into phases for Sylvan Circle and we plan on continuing with the Sylvan Circle up to Pipestone Street where the old chamber was we were going to plan to do that next summer and then more than likely we're, we do them in phases so that we can pay for them afford them and we do them in a fashion that makes sense because sewer flows downhill so you typically want to start on the downhill side so that we can adjust grades and elevations to make sure that we have the right slope and depth on our sanitary sewer. This is more towards the uphill end of this section so I would recommend the issues that we're having that have spurred this is the Clark Insurance building has had a couple backups recently and they're here they can discuss that but I would not recommend that we do a project unless we go back to where we left off last year and start from there, which is what we have highlighted. We had discussed some other options um, that would be less expensive, just replacing the services and, and some main line to get it off underneath that apartment complex. I would not recommend that. We also talked about Rushmore Drive. That project will be starting in the next five years we need to get down to Rushmore and start at the bottom of the hill and extend to this project in this general direction up through Teton, Needles, Yellowstone, Oak Ridge. Um, we could address it then. How many phases do we have left on this thing roughly? Three, four? Aggressively? No. I would say uh, aggressively we have five phases left. And which phase? Which phase would the Clark Insurance originally have been? Of those five, six remaining, because we had talked that it wasn't next year, right? No, it wasn't planned for next year. I mean, if we wanted to extend next year's project into this area, we could. And we're not. I brought it up last time. We're not. This. It's not. We're not wasting money by doing this. This is a project that we would be doing anyway. It's just a matter of when it was when it was phased but there is financial risk of doing it ahead of schedule right because we're getting, we're late in the bid process we're going to knock our, our bids aren't going to be as good there that's is yeah, I mean, that's what we typically not see is as we move forward with projects if you would only if we delay them they get more expensive but it depends on the environment the bidding environment i would i think bidding a project later in the year 
bidding a project in May, which is what we've anticipated for this project because we are trying to move forward with it. We haven't done anything in this area. We haven't surveyed this. So we have to start from the beginning and doing that starting in March, not getting a bid until May, starting construction in June. We think we can get the project done in the end of October. We're, we're looking at higher, potentially higher bid prices because we're bidding it so late in the season. What about the, so we haven't planned for the financing of this in this year's budget. Is there additional considerations and financial risk as a result of not having that in this budget and having to kind of quickly figure out how to pay for that? If the council chooses to move forward with the project, we need to borrow the money. We don't, we don't have the, the fund balance to to pay for whereas in if this was under normal schedule which would be in next year or the year after we wouldn't incur the no, same no historically borrowing we've paid, no historically we've paid for the Sylvan circle improvement projects uh, every other year uh, half out of the sewer and half out of the water funds well we're starting to look at the core part of town as well so we're gonna have to borrow funds to move forward with the core part of town, as well as the Sylvan Circle Rushmore project areas in the future. We, we, we can't afford, we, we don't have enough revenue stream to, to pay cash for them anymore. So we, yeah, we, we're starting the process of borrowing anyhow, so. How much bonding capacity do we have? Fair amount, we have fair amount. capacity. Okay. Um, it's just being able to pay for it. Correct. So this project here would help out Clark Insurance if we did this project. Or was I, did I understand you correctly or did I misunderstand you? We don't, well, so I don't think we're sure. We had, the, we had the lines televised, which we typically do on a sewer project. And normally when we have a problem, we, we, we can find a, a reason for it. I've looked at the video with Raleigh. We've we've looked at the service line and the main line. I don't see any major sags. I don't see any services that are sticking out into the main line, impeding flow. There's no cracks in the pipes. A couple of the services look like they're old because they are, and that's pretty typical. So from an engineering perspective, I can't find the reason why we are having the issue that we are. So moving forward with a project to realign the pipe, unless we know what the real problem is here, it's hard to say that that's going to fix it. And we haven't even talked about the total cost. This is, we said Thursday, 500000 for this piece. And then what percent? So if I drew a whole map on here that was red of everything we need to do, what percent did we think this was? Like 15 or 20, is that where I remember? Compared to the rest of the Silver Circle project? Yeah, it's relatively small. I mean, what we have left over to finish in Sylvan Circle, this, this really isn't part of that project. Sylvan Circle is just that small piece on the north, the north side, which we were going, that portion of this project where it kind of tees at the top, we were going to do that next year and extend that west out to Split Rock and finish Pipestone up around in Sylvan to the north. I guess we're... So I'm not sure if I understand your question, John. I guess the percentage of the rest of this area, it's, I would say, probably 10%. I guess the base of my finished. question is how much are we piecemealing this? If, if we've got 100% left and we're, we're taking this as a loan separate project and we're only addressing 5% of it, then that's also increasing the risk of, of implementation because you're running into different things because you're carving out this one tiny little section to address it when you should be addressing it, as you said, in a piecemeal fashion as part of a broader project. That, that increases the risk as well. And I guess, I mean, that's where I'm at. I want to fix this for the Clarks very, very badly. I think we need to explore all options in, in fixing that, but I don't want to do it at a risk to all of our citizens, whether it be a financial risk, whether it be a, you know, an implementation risk of doing it in a disjointed fashion. So I want to be, before I vote on this, very comfortable that we have explored all the options and laid all the options out on the table. Because we've talked before, 
on Thursday, you know, I said, what about a sewer backflow valve and trying to get that installed? I haven't heard whether we think what the likelihood of success on that and what the costs are of that. Um, I haven't heard what the potential costs are and or likely success of just moving the pipe out from under the building and doing a bypass for the next couple of years. Um, so to me, I'm really not comfortable pushing this so aggressively ahead of schedule, out of order. Uh, I think that just exposes us to too many risks. Um, but I'm not comfortable just dropping and saying we're not going to explore everything else that we can think of um, here before spring. I would agree with John. I, I guess I'd feel more comfortable if I talked with you guys, you know, like during, because I emailed you. But I want to get more of a feel for this and just how it's going to implement everybody over in that area. And uh, have we had any other complaints from any other business home owners, anything like sewer backups? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think that's the only one. But depending on where the backup is and what's causing it, if they're at the lowest point, it makes sense that they that would, would be where be the it would go. The, they would, yeah, they would be the first one to, that would back up, yes. Um, have we looked at that backflow, yeah, sewer that's backflow that's valve? valve? Yeah, I did reach out to a local plumbing company. Um, they said that the rough ballpark estimate would be about 4500 bucks. That could go either way. It was a kind of an informal quote for it. So. How did that work? Tear out the floor, you reroute the plumbing so it has to go through a check valve and it can only allow the water to go out one way and if the pressure back builds on there it'll actually close the trap door so in it that there again that's not a total cure-all because if they were still using water the water could still come up through the floor drain you know because you're stopping the water if the water is being stopped on the manhole side on the main side it's not going to allow any water out either until that pressure exceeds what's outside Well, I, I think we need to get some more discussion on this. I, I, I'm sorry, Clarks, that we have to, because to, I know you're frustrated, and we are also frustrated with this. Yes, yes, sir. And in your communication, it seems like as soon as we jet, you have a backup or well, something close yeah, to it. Yeah, yes, it's becoming worse. Uh, we, we've had this issue for s at least seven years. Um, there was a backfill valve installed at one time up top, but that's not ad that wasn't work. That's not working either. Um, and so um, it's frustrating for us, obviously. And and you know, listening to council here, you guys have a lot of a lot on your plate here. But the one thing I did hear several times today is safe. Uh, got to make sure our citizens are safe I uh, heard that about the wall about the water committee on the water committee uh, talk heard it about mr. Beasley talking about uh, one accidents too many we've had more than one accident at this location okay it's a it's a it, it's a problem it's known and we were promised by the city uh, years ago that would be it would be resolved so that's why there's some frustration on our part um, hopefully it doesn't come across as too aggressive um, we've been patient and we got employees we got businesses there we got public coming into Brandon into our office and I'm I mean so it's it's problematic it's a, it's a it could be a health concern as well and I want to make sure everybody's I, I mean we're all we're, we're all aware of that, so it's on record. Okay, so um, um, I think you've done you've done your due diligence. Riley's done a nice job, but there's some other concerns too. Uh, some of the cameraing uh, when they cameraed across this uh, to the apartment building over to the uh, 
east. Uh, they had trouble, if I remember right, Paul um, or Raleigh actually getting a camera inside. They, they had a couple attempts to get a camera inside that pipe over there too. So that whole infrastructure there is really outdated and it's causing problems for our business and, and health and for employees, businesses, and public. So, thank you. Thank you. And I, I will say for, for both you and, and your wife, um, we understand the frustrations. You have both been very professional, very respectful in, in how you've handled it and your communications with us. So I would like to say that I, I, I appreciate that. Yes, we, we all do. Well, I, I, I guess maybe, maybe another recommendation would be, if the council would consider it, would be there's a proposal here on the table today. Okay, Maybe we could find out, do some discovery, accept the proposal, and see if they can repair it. They can, I mean, Stockwell, the engineering firm, could surely, when they get into the project, they could discover or find out what actually is causing the problem. Nobody knows. I mean, it could be a combination of things, right? That's what we're saying. So that would be something that it would I mean, be that, nice. Obviously, we bid the entire project. Is, is that Stockwell could your, speak for? I think yeah, they could probably speak I can't. for. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm not sure what we would find. I mean, I've, I've done the same thing I have done looking at video, and unless you actually dig it up, that's the best proof we have is video. And so I'm not sure what, what uh, Stockwell would do to well, whether or not we would. Paul, I'm the only thing I'm saying is based on your comments, you, you said earlier, you commented that it was unknown if this, this fix would even if this repair would even cause, you know, fix the problem. I'm not saying that the repair would fix the problem. I'm saying we haven't determined what the problem is. So in order, to, in order to recommend moving forward with the project as the engineer, I would say that if we move forward with the project, it's going to be something that we would do in the future anyway. It's just that we have a particular problem right now that isn't being necessarily addressed or solved just by putting in a new sanitary sewer. So, question, Mr. Clark. You had yes. said that your current valve wasn't working. Is it broke or it just doesn't work? No, it's um, it's a surface type valve. It's a surface valve, so it's not a valve like what uh, Raleigh was talking about. The the valve he was referring to is a subsurface one where they'd actually go down and hook it underneath the concrete and that sort of thing. So, so would you be opposed if we tried that? I mean, I'm not saying that the city would, but. Um, I'd have to discuss it with my wife. Yeah, we'd have to find out what, I don't know how long that would take, probably two days, right, and see what kind of inconvenience that would something, be. Something, doing something moving forward rather than waiting and doing more work, doing camera and doing more. It's just, this, the problem's not going to go away, okay? So, if you're saying, Mr. Parsons, if you're saying, if you're saying, yeah, um, you know, if we went that route with that subsurface valve system, I would say absolutely, let's try it. But we don't want to forget about, I mean, if this, I'd be, we would be open to anything because it's a health hazard. You got sewage and you got bleach odor and all that. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's a, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you put a value? I know it's a lot of money. How do you put a value on, on life, on health? think your own basements yeah. so and you have been very patient and I, and I agree though with what Paul's saying I mean and John too is we have to take into consideration the whole project so if we were able to try this other route and it took a couple days and cost 4,500 bucks maybe we should consider trying that let's try and get that option as well if there's one or two other ones um, here in the next two weeks I mean I let's let's keep talking about it are we are we are we going to continue to kick the can down that's my concern do we continue to because if this doesn't work then all of a sudden we're out to 19 or 20 and if we got five phases I don't know I mean where, where does this thing end 
Well, and Raleigh, how I'm, soon? I'm just oh, asking. Sorry. 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 Um, how soon can they get this sewer backup valve? I mean, this weekend? At, well, in a couple weeks, a month, two months? Like I say, it was just an informal quote. I just talked to them on the phone. We put some numbers together. Because so. I would no be... Right. Okay. Well, I would be more in favor of sewer backup valve, spending the 4500 versus the 500000 right now, especially if this isn't... If it's on the wrong, or you know, we're not doing it in the right order, I, I have a little bit of a problem with that just because we want the whole area to be safe. And I sympathize with you guys because I, you know, I'm at a loss for really what to do, but I think if we can do something like this and maybe do another avenue, just trying to get it to work, uh, see what the problem is, I'd be open to that. Keep in, keep in mind that this was addressed several years ago. The city's been aware of this. So it's not like it happened today. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, right. And so, from a budgetary standpoint, um, it should have been addressed five, six, seven years ago. So. Right. Thank okay. you. And, and to clarify, this isn't necessarily on the wrong end of a project. It's just the timing of it and the size of it. It could be included in a project next year. We can continue the so and circle the rest of the project. We're looking at anywhere between one and one and a half million dollars on a larger project, but the scale of the work that we try to accomplish, we can get better unit prices, we can plan for it better, include it in an overall project, and move forward with it. So then could we try the, the valve and then plan a bigger project, including that piece for, I guess, 19, so we could get it bid earlier and get it done then, hoping that the valve works up until that point? Because we're not going to get it done anyway until late fall, so late fall versus next summer, I'm not sure that that's going to make that much of a difference. No offense, but... Like I said, if we knew what the problem was and we knew that we were addressing that, I know that we've talked about Raleigh and his guys addressing the, the cleaning of it every whatever, couple months or however often. And I, I know that it backed up once before when they cleaned it out, which is very unusual. And how that happened or why it happened, no, we don't know. So uh, that's, that's frustrating too because if we knew what the problem was, we would want to try to take care of that don't see it in the sewer video and Raleigh's he's watched it too we both agree there's nothing well, there obviously there's a problem there's someplace yeah, there's a problem somewhere. and they have been more than respectful yeah. and they more, than more patient than many of us would be yeah. if as you said if it was our basements so we need to we need to come to a quick solution um, and I know it's going to take a little bit more discussion, so please be patient with us. And, but yes, we can't say, oh, uh, we'll get to it sometime soon. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, please. Please. <clears throat> and then also with the, how long it would take to put it in, what digging we'd have to do and that type of stuff. Thank you. Raleigh. <clears throat> Anything else, water sewer? Any other business before council? I would just add, I was at the county day for equalization stuff, and that will be coming out the end of this week. And just mark on your calendar that equalization board meetings will be March 20th and possibly the 21st. Um, I know the water committee is that night, but equalization would take precedent. Um, I don't know until we get, you know, that they come in on how many nights it will take. Um, we did increase, the town did increase anywhere from 6 to 7%, so we may have a couple nights. I don't know, we won't know yet. Um, but those do go out Friday, so we will start collecting next Monday. Um, the last day to receive the appeals would be March 15th. Do we have executive session? I request that we go into executive session. Take it down for personnel or for potential litigation. I'll make that motion. 
I have a motion and a second to go into executive session. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed?